Colonel Parker, I heard you a little bit of your talk, and you talked about your top ten movies. First movie you ever saw? I don't know if this means, but the first movie I ever saw was Santa Claus vs. versus the Martians. I'm not sure what that means. I'm gonna stand up. Yeah, it was it was pretty. It was it was really bad. <laughs> it was a really bad movie. But thank you for for um, inviting me here to share. Uh, my leadership observations, and, and, and I guess you would have to call them observations. Um, I, I hope most of you have read the bio uh, on me, so you know, um, you know, Matt Bevan's really good at summing up my life in 90 seconds. So, uh, you know, basically, from Detroit, grew up in poverty, worked my way through engineering school, worked for GM for five years, uh, joined the Air Force, served seven years in the Air Force, Desert Storm, then worked 19 years in the corrugated packaging industry, starting out as a, a, uh, a machine supervisor, quickly uh, uh, promoted to plant manage, manager ultimately, but then I, I wanted to try sales and I stayed there because Meeting people is fun, and seeing other manufacturing floors is fun. So, uh, got into uh, this. Never saw this coming, though. Uh, that was actually through the tea party, but I'll talk about that. So, so when I was coming up, when I was growing up, I never thought of myself as a leader. I, I really didn't. I was, I was the person. I was really quiet. If you invited me to a party, I would have taken a book. Uh, really, I would have taken a book to a party. And I was the person, as a kid, to kind of sit in the corner and observe, quietly observe what the adults were saying. You know, when, when adults think kids aren't look, listening or, or uh, looking at them. Uh, so I was, I was kind of an observer. Uh, but you know what? When you observe, you learn a lot. You, you see a lot. And you start developing opinions uh, of the world. And of course, my first 10 years, since I was born in 1958, my first 10 years were the turbulent 1960s. And for those of you who don't have gray hair, uh, let me tell you what the 60s was like. Uh, there was, of course, we had the, the Vietnam War. Uh, there were hippies. There, was, there were riots. There were assassinations. We had a president assassinated, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Uh, just a lot of turbulence and throw into the mix um, kids, my peers, who were questioning my choices at the time, uh, questioning the fact that I was getting good grades, I read a lot even when a no book report was required, even questioning my choice of music because I guess if you're black and live in Detroit you're only supposed to listen to R&B. And I listened to everything, including uh, British rock, which I still love. So, uh, so I, I was. What that forced me to do was become sort of a budding constitutionalist, because the question I asked in my head was, at what point in my life am I going to just get to be Janine, with my own likes and dislikes? And I knew because you know we read the Constitution at some point, and you know like most kids, it went in one ear and out the other. But I did remember that as an individual, I have rights. And I knew I didn't have to listen to all these other kids. I, whatever road they were on, I didn't have to follow them. I knew I could chart my own course. And so I did. So I kind of uh, ended up, um, I won't say by accident, because now at this point in my life, I can fully see God's hand in my life. And I, can, I know God, you know, I didn't get here as lieutenant governor by myself. I can tell you that. This wasn't even on my bucket list. Um, my assistant can tell you that my bucket list is long, and it includes things like zip mining and learning to sheetrock. Um, but being, but being lieutenant governor uh, is not on that list, <laughs> or or uh, any any uh, office is not on that list. So when I was older, though, I tell you, um, well, and one of the other key things in the, in the 1960s I have to mention this was the space program. The space program was in its heyday, and I loved it. Uh, in the years when we had a TV set, because we didn't always have a TV set, I, would, I was the sole person in my household that was up very early, curled up on the couch, watching these launches, watching the splashdowns, and I mean, I just had super big dreams of being an astronaut. Um, I have to tell you, I was uh, not impressed years later with the first female astronaut nor was I impressed with the first black astronaut, but I was really impressed when they had the first mission specialist who wore glasses, because it meant I had a chance. <laughs> Absolutely, I was thrilled. So, uh, 
But the space program colored what I read because I read a lot of science fiction. In high school, I was given the option of studying the classics or science fiction. And so I opted for science fiction. And uh, it, it colored what I watched on TV, you know, Star Trek. You know, I remember Star Wars, 1977. I'd lost count how many times I saw that movie. But when, as a young adult, though, I so wanted to be James Kirk. You know, so this is how I kind of kind of looked at leadership was through the lens of Star Trek. So you had James Kirk, quick on his feet, always could get out of, could talk his way out of anything, always had a solution, was always thinking, bringing people together, do it, do it. I mean, even the reboot is is awesome. Even the reboot version, you know, James Kirk. So I was like, oh well, I'm nothing like him. Okay, but maybe I'm more like Spock, who's very logical and you know unemotional. Well, let's not be either, because I'm not that logical, and I'm, and I'm, I'm emotional, which makes me like Leonard McCoy, Dr. McCoy, he's got the hands waving, you know, what are we gonna do? You know, I'm an engineer, damn it, not a, not a, you know, I'm a doctor, not an engineer, you know, he was always, you know, he was the emotional one. So I was, I realized I was neither of those people, but maybe a sort of a composite of those people. And then if, you, if you're like me and you watched all the, all the spinoffs, all the uh, starship captains, kind of, they were all different. It, it really is. I wish somebody would do a class on leadership um, analyzing these starship captains because you had, you had Joe Luke Picard, you know, to this day, Earl Grey tea, hot, that's me, dash of cream and sugar. Um, you had Kat, uh, Catherine Janeway, um, you know, female starship captain. You had Benjamin Sisko, you know, the black starship captain, but they all were so different, just different styles. And, uh, and I realized that was none of them, but I'm my own person. And so all of you will have your own styles. You really will, but you may see pieces. And uh, I love the movies because, you know, every time I watch a movie, I'm, I can never just go to a movie. I'm usually analyzing the characters. Um, and even even today, one of the things I one of my guilty pleasures is The Walking Dead, and and I watch the I actually like the dynamics, the people dynamics, but I also like the leadership uh, lessons in, in Walking Dead. So we we don't have time to go get into that. Um, the walk every time I mention The Walking Dead when I'm talking to kids, we could talk an entire hour on just that show alone. Um, so I hope the teachers were uh, were listening, um, but so but so over the years though I just so I kind of jotted down some notes on the way here to kind of summarize some of the leadership principles that I've employed throughout my I mean it's and it's been a very interesting career it's you know uh, when Matt used to uh, talk about me and sum up my life he'd say things like and she's incredible she's remarkable I'm the first person to tell you I'm not incredible or remarkable. I was just pursuing happiness as I saw it, looking for interesting work, uh, always intellectually curious about whatever job I was doing. Uh, one of the kids, when I was in front of some fourth graders, one of the questions was, what was the most boring job you ever had? And it was the first job I had out of high school, part-time proof machine operator. Anybody know what a proof machine operator is? Oh, I see some hands go up. Uh, they're the person behind the, behind the scenes who process canceled checks. Uh, if you look at your check, the, uh, the amount of the check needs to be encoded on there so it can be processed automatically. Well, what they have, well, at least back in the 70s, they had a bunch of people sitting there. You pick up a check, you type in the amount, and put the, you drop the check in the channel and it prints it on. And you do that hour after hour after hour. But it was great, it was great pocket money if you're in college. Um, but boring, yeah, it was pretty boring. But I tell the kids what I learned was that numeric keypad. I, today, to this day, especially as spreadsheets came up, came up, came up to be in use, I know that numeric keypad, I could do numbers without, without the, um, without looking at it. Um, but when I, um, when I worked at General Motors, uh, people assume I worked on the line, I did not. I was actually a, 
a computer operator. Now this was back in the 70s and 80s when computers filled the room and they required lots of cooling, you know, the IBM mainframes. And as soon as I came in, you know, there, there were people who worked there for decades and just were not, they had never, they never, they did exactly what they were, to, were supposed to do and nothing more. Well, I was the one over in the, in the racks. If the IBM guy was over there, you know, with the racks open and he was troubleshooting something, I'm looking right over his shoulder. Then I'd go hang out with the, the analysts. And then I was on my lunch break, I'd go, to, go around the building to, and poke my head into the offices and see what was going on. And um, just intellectually curious about the company as a whole. And that's kind of, that intellectual curiosity is kind of what led to the promotions later in the box industry because I was curious about how the plant worked. So I started out as a corrugator supervisor uh, in, right after I left the military. And I was a, it was a machine center, I had a crew, and all it made was sheets of cardboard. And those sheets of cardboard went to another machine to be turned into a box, to be printed and stamped and die cut and turned into a box. Well, before I got to that plant, nobody ever ventured out of their silos. They stayed with their, within their departments. And they're all bumping heads for some reason or, or another. So I would go over to the press department and talk to those folks and see what's going on and see how I could make things better with the products I was sending them. Uh, then I got curious about how the orders came out to the floor, so I started hanging out and scheduling. I was curious about how they cubed out trailers back in shipping in the shipping department. So I started hanging out there too. So just the whole that whole pro and then the whole process of just walking around the plant and talking to people, I'd be tweaking processes because I, I mean, my degree is industrial engineering, so process improvement mentality. And so it was that was the process that led to promotions. But what I wanted, what I want to tell you is that quality, that uh, attribute of, of asking questions and meeting people, I still have that. I have been, uh, Governor Bevin and I have been astounded, actually. We have been, you know, how many of you have met Governor Bevin? How many here? Well, he's probably, he's going to get over to your cabinet sooner or later. And you may just pop in, don't be surprised. Um, we have been doing that. We will, we're, he, he, we will poke our heads into an office as we're walking through the hall, stop and say hello. We've visited various cabinets. Uh, over the holidays, the Christmas holidays, we visited the we visited health and human health and family services. Uh, everybody came in the lunchroom. There were, there were I think it looked like hundreds of people to me. And afterwards, uh, two people came up to me and said they were stunned that we were there because they said it was the, the both of these women had been there for uh, almost 20 years, and they said in their 20 years, no governor or lieutenant governor had ever come to speak to them. Um, in, the, in the 1980s, there was a principle called management by walking around. Uh, and I, I believe in that. When I was the plant manager, I was always out on the floor talking to the crews, uh, seeing what's going on firsthand. And you, you have to temper how you do that because sometimes you can get in the way. So you don't want to get in the way. But I believe that talking to people, meeting people, there's no substitute for it. Uh, so I, I will, I won't even, I'll use email very little. Um, I will, and I know how actually. I'm, <laughs> it's not that I don't know how to use, I, I can use email, but I would rather get up, walk, you know, across the length of the building and go talk to somebody. And it's just, there's just no substitute for face to face. I learned that in sales too. Uh, there's the, um, the sales process is large, it's, it's driven by face-to-face -face interaction. And I think in, when, when, uh, when you're running a plant, when you're working with each other, there's just no substitute for doing that. So, so if I had to sum that up, it's just talk to each other, you know, but face-to-face. But -face. Uh, I've heard that millennials sometimes have a problem talking on the phone. I, I read in the Wall Street Journal, there's a company that actually goes around to teach people how to talk on the phone. <laughs> If you can imagine that, because what was happening was I, they said in the article that millennials were after when they were hired, they the first thing they do is unplug their phone and put it in the cabinet. 
because they're used to mailing, emailing, they're used to, used to texting, and, but there are some jobs that require you to speak on the phone and it's becoming a lost art, so uh, just speak to each other. Uh, be a lifelong learner. I, I am on a mission to get Kentuckians to be to become lifelong learners. Uh, as I as I talk around the state, when I, especially when I talk to kids, you know, I tell them. I, I, first of all, I, I my sisters and I were avid readers. We could not believe the library was free when we were kids. Uh, we were we were you know, that was just almost too good to be true. Uh, so. Over our lifetimes, uh, by the way, my, my three sisters and I, despite, despite growing up poor, we're all first generation college. Uh, despite a, a, a single mom who didn't make it past eighth grade, uh, all four of us are first generation college. So we all, we recognized there was, there was something better and it was up to us to make that happen and we did. Uh, but just to get people to become lifelong learners, uh, most, if you read about most CEOs, uh, they're always reading something. They're in, usually it's, it's non-fiction, uh, but they're usually reading about maybe other leaders. I love uh, books by, by Malcolm Gladwell. He just explores uh, topics, a range of topics on so many things. Uh, so, but just always be learning something because you can there's you can apply it to your your current job in some measure uh, or another. Um, when I walked in, you were talking about the cathedrals. Um, I somebody gave me a copy of that book and I and I read that. I usually have like two or three books going at the same time. It is a very good book. Uh, let's see. Uh, don't stay on the sidelines. I think. You know, even though throughout, even though I didn't think I was a leader, it turns out when I, as when I look back, there were some hallmarks. Um, one thing when I was in junior high, I remember standing. I remember I stood up to the lunch lady. I mean, <laughs> and I couldn't help it. We were just in line, and she accused the boy behind me of something which I knew he hadn't done because I was standing right there, and I just, without even thinking, I just said something back to her like, "No, he didn't." And, she got really mad at me because I challenged her authority, but you know what? I knew I was right. Fast forward later to when I was in, uh, the, in the Air Force, um, I was, and Desert Shield uh, had kicked off. This was the run-up to Desert Storm. Uh, my unit mobilized. I was with the 552nd AWACS wing, you know, the jet with the dome on top. And uh, there were just, not everybody in my unit deployed. There were about six of us who had to keep our bags packed. And I was at the bottom of that list because I was the newest in the unit. I hadn't even been there six months, I don't think. So Desert Storm kicked off. They sent the person at the top of the list. And the number two guy um, was a guy, uh, we were the same rank, and he had told me from the day I had come to that unit how he was, he was hell-bent to do as little as possible for the Air Force because he was mad at them about something. Well, I knew he wasn't trained enough. I knew that this was life or death uh, because what we did, um, I was a software tester, but we also did, uh, part of our mission was to replay these, these AWACS missions that would help us locate downed pilots, help us track an enemy plane. And I knew if this guy went, people could die, two deaths. So I bypassed my boss, my boss's boss and his boss, because they'd been, you know, kicking this guy from, you know, from, from uh, month to month, uh, just stringing him along. And so I went to the commander and told him what I just said to you, and I implored him not to send this guy. And so my commander listened, and he moved this guy down to the number, he moved him to the bottom of the list from number two, and, but what he did next I did not expect. He moved me up to the number two position. Yeah, and so that was how I ended up um, being deployed to Desert Storm. Uh, and of course, once I got there, they kept extending the stay, and so I, I ended up being there for the for uh, for seven months. But sometimes you got to stand up for what's right. You have to. You absolutely have to. Um, you know, sometimes we see things and we think maybe somebody else is going to take care of it or it'll work itself out. But you know, sometimes you just you got to say something, and you got to do something. And sometimes the person to, who should do something is you. Uh, don't wait for somebody else to fix it. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, know the mission. This is one of the, the lessons I've learned from the military. Uh, in the military, so in the Air Force, the Air Force's mission is fly, fight, win. That's the big overall arching mission. Uh, and so everything else, every unit underneath that has their own mission, but they all dovetail into the, big, the bigger mission. And everybody knows their part. And it's important that everybody does their part, does their part because it feeds up to support that, that top mission. So when I ran a, back, a box plant, when I ran my little box plant, and the and it was it, you know the 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 crews when I first got there wow I've never it was like I was I had a class full of kindergartners or something because they're all sniping at each other they're all fighting each other and the maintenance guy didn't like the supervisors and they didn't want to work together and I said listen guys we're not launching shuttles here and it's a good thing because you would have killed the astronauts we're not launching shuttles we are making but your mission is to get boxes out of the door. And if we don't get boxes out of the door, we lose customers, and we don't get new customers, and then this box plant shuts down. Because our company looks for profit. They look for profitable companies. And so once I ensure that everybody knew what their part is, knew what the overarching mission is, things got a lot better. It got much better. So just make sure everybody knows well, what, what the mission is, know what your part is in doing that, that mission. Um, it just makes it more fun to come to work when you know um, that your work counts. It, it really does. Um, Matt Bevan said one time last year when I was going to be speaking to some entrepreneurs, um, I asked him if there was any advice that he would pass on. And he said this. He said, if your head and your heart don't show up to, to work at the same time as your feet, then you're in the wrong job. You're in the wrong job. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times when I first went to work in a plant as, as a supervisor, the number of people out on the floor who told me they hated their jobs. And I asked them why they were there. Why are you sticking around? And they had so little faith in their own abilities you know, that's, that's why they stuck around, but, you know, I told them I would never stick around in a job I hated. Never, ever. Uh, so think about, think about that. Um, if, if you're not excited about coming to work, then, you, then something needs to change. Maybe not your job, but maybe your approach to your job. So, so just think about that. Um, and don't stay on the sidelines. Again, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, saying something. Uh, so I got involved in the Tea Party down in Bowling Green. I was, and I ended up the chairman. And said, I, again, so here's the reluctant leader. I didn't plan on being the chairman, but my paths crossed with Matt Benins in the Tea Party. Um, I was part of a group that vetted him when he was thinking about running for the Senate. Now, I, I had no intention of being part of that process. You know, I was working, I was, um, I was doing doing uh, doing well I just didn't have the time and um, but I not only ended up on the committee uh, I ended up chairman of the committee and we actually ended up putting together a really good process that you could really use to vet any candidate because we canvass people from across the state ended up putting together a six page uh, pool of questions um, we had him do a pre questionnaire we had him um, uh, let's see we asked him for a resume, he didn't have one. Have one. He's always been an entrepreneur and worked for himself. And then we grilled him for three hours. So imagine if you could just take every candidate and just interview them for three hours. Um, and I just walked away just so impressed with who Matt Bevan is as a, as a, uh, a husband, a father, an entrepreneur. Um, he was so impressive. And so, um, I, you know, I don't know if you guys remember that Senate race. It got a little testy. Um, but you know what? I, I believed I was doing the right thing and backing him. And uh, I remember when he lost, I remember thinking, uh, Kentucky, I just don't think God's going to give you another shot at Matt Bevan. But little, what did I know? So, you know, you know, God had other plans, and I guess I was a part of those plans. So, but, you know, sometimes you can't stay on the sidelines. You've got you to get in there and get involved. You really do. Just jump in there and just do it. You know, and I think if we had more citizens who did that in whatever capacity, then I think we'd be, I think our, our nation would be better off for it. Um, make your days count. Just make them count. 
you know, the, the governor just lost a, a 14, his 14-year-old 14 nephew um, the other week to brain tumors. And um, it was, you know, I went to the funeral and to celebrate. This, general, this guy was just incredible. We just lost an incredible person. But on the way home, I was just thinking, you know, what if this was my last day on earth? What if tomorrow was my last day on earth? Have I made my days count? You know, and I, I hope I have. I'm, I'm getting to speak to uh, students uh, and share my life story. Um, I, we were hearing last year from teachers and, and, and other adults that the story of my rise from poverty uh, was inspirational, and they wanted me to share it with their kids, and I've been doing that. And so, I, you know, if maybe I've inspired, you know, two people in the thousands of kids I've spoken to, then it's all been worth it. It really has. And so I just want to make my days count. And so I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to, to you all and just share some, some, uh, some lessons learned over, over the uh, course of my, um, of my career. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much longer because I want to take some questions, but um, just a couple more principles. Uh, know what you believe and why you believe it. And then the number one principle for me is just pray every day. I pray, I ask for guidance every day. Just, just Lord, just help me, help me live in a way that pleases you. And if I do that, everything else falls into place. It truly does. And, and really, my life didn't start getting interesting until I gave my life to Christ about five years ago. Uh, that's when, you know, you may have thought my career was successful up to that point, but that's when the interesting stuff started happening. And, uh, and that includes um, Matt Bevan and being called to run for, for office. So, um, so I'm going to stop here and just take any questions you might have, because this is always the interesting part. Yes, ma'am. So thank you so much for your comments today. And you spoke to the Teen Pact, I don't know if you remember, during the spring break. And you mentioned three E's that you're looking to do. Can you share that with us, Chris? Yes, thank you. Okay, so one of, one of the questions that comes up often is, what does the lieutenant governor do? And um, I had to look it up, too, when Matt asked me to be his running mate. <laughs> I really did. Uh, so I, I went to um, Lieutenant Governor Crit Llewellyn's webpage and read her webpage, and then I went to the Kentucky Constitution, because that's our playbook, and it turns out I have no constitutional duties. Uh, up through 1992, I would have been in charge of the Senate, but they did away with that. And so there's some boards and commissions, but they don't, they don't take that much time. So it basically comes down to whatever the governor and lieutenant governor agree upon, and Governor Bevan has allowed me to focus on three areas. Uh, one is entrepreneurship, and we're we are so excited about this. We are, I'm gonna, I'm calling myself an entrepreneurial ambassador. We are, uh, we are, t we are going to promote entrepreneurship in Kentucky. Uh, it turns out there's some programs uh, that many Kentuckians don't know about. Uh, junior, actually yesterday we were at the pitch competition that Junior Achievement sponsors. We're going to partner with the Innovation Centers, Kentucky's Innovation Centers, Junior Achievement, and we're going to put something together we're going to call the Lieutenant Governor's Challenge. And it's kind of going to be a pitch competition, but we're trying to make it a little bit different. Uh, but my objective, though, is number one, to get entrepreneurial skills in front of kids at a very young age. I want to get kids excited at the opportunity of starting their own business. And we saw that yesterday. We saw some high schoolers who were really excited about doing that. But I want to reach them even younger than that. But the second thing is we want to implement policies that will attract entrepreneurs to Kentucky. So if they've got an, if you're in another state, you've got an idea, you're going to say, I'm going to Kentucky because that's where the support systems are, that's where the venture capitalists are, that's where, that's where the fun stuff to do is. Um, you guys know that the, that Kentucky has, apparently we're, we're, we have some, some class A rock climbing areas here. Do you guys know, anybody here rock climb? Ooh, one person. <laughs> Usually I get no hands on that. <laughs> um, but apparently there's some world-class rock climbing in, in Kentucky. Uh, and when we, um, when we were traveling to Babyville a couple of weeks ago, we passed this one field 
and it's dotted with these tiny little one-person tents, the kind you can backpack. And the reason the, they had pitched their, their tents in a field is because there really aren't any hotels around. So there's nothing, so, these, so people are coming to Kentucky to go rock climbing and there's nothing else to capture their tourism dollars. There's no restaurants, there's no, there's no, um, no hotels, and so we're looking to capitalize on the types of things and activities that attract uh, entrepreneurs uh, to Kentucky. So really excited about that. So the second thing I'm focusing on is education. I'm promoting education of all forms, not just a four-year degree, uh, unconventional forms of education, vocational training, which is a, a path to a very rewarding career in manufacturing, and I love manufacturing. Um, uh, but, but I want again, I want to I want to convince Kentuckians of all ages to just become lifelong learners. And when I talk to the kids, I often tell them some of the things that I've done uh, that really didn't involve sitting in a classroom. Like for example, in summer that I took electric guitar lessons just because, and I found a teacher who taught me riffs to Led Zeppelin songs and ACDC songs, and I've, I've kind of gotten rusty, so I'm gonna take my guitar eventually to the Capitol here. So if you hear some strains of ACDC songs, that'll be me. Um, one summer I, I did take UK's, um, it was their Master Gardener class. They offered it at the Extension Office in Bowling Green. And uh, I, I've learned that I'm a lousy gardener. I would starve if I had to depend on my own skills. But I still do compost. And last year I had a bumper crop of sweet potatoes, which uh, my 88-year-old my mom, who lives with us, uh, turned into, uh, in, into really tasty pies. So, um, so I'm going to do that again, because sweet potatoes are easy. You don't have to water them. Uh, and, then there's the, <laughs> and then there's the year that, uh, the summer that I signed my husband and myself up for country line dance lessons. And I'm, I'm forever grateful there is no video footage of that. Um, but we had a heck of a good time. And so just to, you know, there's always something new to learn. Um, uh, my, my assistant was watching me take notes last night during the pitch contest. I, somebody mentioned, a, one of the teams mentioned a programming language that I don't know, and so that's on my list, that's on my bucket list too. Actually, on my bucket list, you mentioned apps. I want to learn to program apps. I'm going to do that. That's still on my list to do. That's actually what I was planning to do when Matt Bevin called. He just totally ruined my, my plans. So. Um, <laughs> So entrepreneurship, education, and the third thing, and this is probably the most important, I'm calling it just being an example. And that is to, to be an example to those who don't believe they can achieve or even pursue the American dream. Because what I heard on the campaign trail last year, what I'm still hearing as I travel around the Commonwealth, is that there are adults, but even even sadder, it's kids who aren't looking beyond high school because they're saying, well, I don't have to worry about working because I can just get a check. We need to change that. We, we need to change that quickly. And so if I can talk to kids and get them excited about the potential that they have to do something, whatever that is, then it, you know, then this will have all been worth it. So I'm determined to reach as many kids as I can and you know the priority is it's on the kids um, because they're, they're going to dismiss soon um, in May uh, school's going to be out so but so far in just four four and a half months it's been thousands of kids I've spoken to which is awesome so those are the three um, yeah E3 is what we're calling it so yeah so that's it okay another question yes I enjoyed hearing about your uh, push for entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, oftentimes in state government, we get the bad rap of being non-innovative and kind of having stagnant innovation. Do you, Governor Bevin, have any plans to kind of rejuvenate our, our push for innovation here within state government and being state government employees? Well, I know that Governor Bevin has put the call out um, last year, shortly after we were sworn in, looking for ideas from state workers. Uh, because, you know, let's face it, it the, the, the folks with the ideas are the closest to the job. You, you know what, can, what needs to improve, you know what, can, what, what, um, what needs to change. Um, I actually would love it if they would do, uh, they used to do in some, and they probably still do in certain businesses, a, um, where you would share part of the cost savings. 
Um, and that really gets people busy submitting ideas. And so I don't know what the status is of that particular hotline. It's probably still open, but maybe we just need to push it again uh, to say, listen, we want your ideas. We want to hear, um, you know, what would you improve? What would you change? What would you do differently to make gov government more innovative and more efficient? Because uh, we can do this. Uh, one of the questions I get a lot is, 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 is being lieutenant governor what you thought it was? And I said, hmm, so government is kind of big and bloated and slow, so yes. Um, <laughs> you know, which I hate to say that, but you know, we just watched the session, uh, and to me it just killed me. The, the, the session starts, the legislative session started in the beginning of January, but, they, but there was hesitation to do anything because they had to wait for the filing deadline, which was at the end of January. And then some were waiting on the, um, the results of the special elections in March. So now we've just killed 10 weeks. We've just wasted 10 weeks um, and got very little done. And that's why there's the crunch at, at the end to pass the budget. You know, and, and I'm just, you know, there's one night they were up till 3 in the morning, which is nuts. That, you know, okay, sometimes I'm up till 3 in the morning, but that's a different story. But, but that's just, that's, it doesn't have to be that way. I, I'm a firm believer that government does not have to be.